G'day. In this series of videos, we are using Psychopy and Python to create the line bisection task. Now you'd be asking yourself, well, what is the line bisection task? What's it used for? Here, here's a scenario. Uh, you've got a person who's unfortunately suffered a stroke to their parietal cortex. And one of the consequences that can happen when we lose function of this cortex is we fail to attend or to pay attention to certain parts of our visual field. Now, if that stroke or loss of function is significant or severe enough, we've knocked out a fair whack of cortical territory. What can happen is you can get a hemispheric neglect. And so essentially, if you, if you draw a, a line straight down from your nose outwards, and let's say we've, we've lost the function of the right parietal cortex, what can happen is, is that I fail to attend or pay attention to the complete left hemisphere, visual hemisphere. Obviously, this can have some impact in day-to-day -day function, like the visual cortex right at the back in the occipital lobe, that's still working. All the optic radiations may be working, optic nerve is still working, and your reflexes are still working, but it's the higher cortical functions, it's that binding narrative, the attention, which seems to be impaired. And this is what we're going to try and probe using the line bisection task. Now, as with a lot of my other videos, uh, the other video playlist, we're going to base our experiment very roughly on a previous paper. In this case, it's going to be um, by Kim et al. So it's a 2005 neuroscience letters paper. So we're getting sort of 15 years old now. But hey, look, it's a perfectly fine template for us to use. And I know, for instance, some people in, uh, in Australia, in uh, Perth, for instance, um, are using this to, to look at the effects of um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So it's it's a little bit similar to, to this because as we can see, Kim et al. Were, were whomping the cortex with some TMS and seeing what happens to visuospatial attention. So, all right, in the posterior parietal cortex, hey, everything's coming together. So in this series of videos, we will start from scratch, start with nothing and build up slowly until we get a working program that can record keyboard input and save Excel s spreadsheet files for your analysis later on and it will do all the timing and control and everything, okay? But as with everything else, we start with nothing. We actually start with something. What do we start with? Okay, what's the workflow going to be? What we're going to do, I'll put that Kim paper to the back there. We'll get to that in the future. I'm gonna clear this. Now, I'm working on a Mac if you're working on a Windows machine or a Linux machine, it's roughly the same um, process. But I'm writing this on a Mac. It's an old MacBook Air. Um, I've got an external monitor here. So if I'm looking over here, that's because that's where I'm capturing at the moment. But my camera is here and my OBS recording is on this screen. Okay, so I've got this screen and this screen currently. What's my workflow or what's the suggested workflow? Well, we need two things here. We need, firstly, a text editor. You could use anything. You could use Microsoft Word if you wanted to. I'd suggest you don't, but you, know, you could get away with using something like that. What I'm using here is a program called Atom. It's uh, open source. It's um, very cool to use. Um, and it's available at atom.io. You can see here, so uh, as of today, they're currently at 1.5. 1.44.0, download that, and then we're going to write our Python script files in Atom. So Atom is just a text editor. The reason why we use Atom, if you're not familiar with, is because what we will do is we can actually save our text files as .py files, and then Atom now knows that, hey, this is a Python file. We can see it down the bottom here. It says, hey, this file uses the Python language or Python grammar, and it will change the colors of certain words, like if we use the word import. We'll go through that in the future. If we wanted to import things, um, we could import, uh, sorry, it changes the color, and so we can see errors and all that sort of stuff, okay? So, text editor. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to save, I like to save two files. One is the actual file that we will use. In this case, I'm calling it line underscore task dot py. And I'm saving that into a certain folder, okay? In my case, it's on the desktop and I've tucked it away in a couple of um, other folders, okay? So 
Open up your Atom or your text editor, save your file, make sure you use the .py ending. So in this case, I'll put it in this doc string. So three apostrophes here, followed by three apostrophes here. Anything inside this is called a doc string and it won't be executed by the program because it knows, hey, look, this is just a comment. All right, so um, open your Atom and then uh, create a new file. and then save that file as whatever you want. So star, 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 dot py, okay? And now it's, <laughs> okay, it's, so the other thing that Atom does is it will auto, uh, it will auto complete things and we don't want that. Okay, dot py, so you see it's coming up as property, new property. If I just hit space bar, it gets rid of that, if that, hey, would you like some help? Okay, we don't want that help. So in my case, I'm saving this as line underscore task dot py. So this is my file that I'm saving and this is where our program's going to go. Okay, what I like to do as well in addition to that is I like to create a sandbox. Like when you're a kid, you can muck around in a sandbox and nothing is permanent except the broken dreams of being a, a construction worker with you when you pretend to shift all the sand around. Anyway, so I also like to create a sandbox. And so in a second file, so open, so atom file, new file, I've created a second uh, file here. We'll create another jock string and this is a sand box. So here I can work out anything. Okay, so if I'm struggling with a certain thing that I'm like, I can't get keyboard input or I, I can't do this, I can't do that. What I'll do is I'll basically program it in this sandbox area. Think of it as like a scratch pad or a scrapbook. And then once we get it working here, then we can put this, you know, once it's working here, uh, we then put it back into uh, our main program. Okay, now, I do make lots of spelling mistakes, but that's okay. Python will find them for us. Okay, so I've got two files here. One is the main program file. The other one is just a sandbox area where we can muck around. Okay, now you'll notice that I've made some changes to these files and we've got the um, blue circle up here. See, you got that blue circle just above my mouse here and a blue circle just above my mouse here. That tells me, hey, you haven't saved these changes. And so on a Mac, you just command S and it will save. And so you can see now we're in the sandbox program and that blue circle has now disappeared. So if I go and click here on the line task file, command S, see how that circle has gone again. So now I know by just looking up that top there, hey, I've saved the changes. Anytime we make, we make more changes, Okay, that blue circle comes back and so now I need to command S again and it will, that's just the shortcut for saving. If you're using a Windows machine, Atom will still work, will still work wonderfully. You'll have to use, I think, Control S, but um, it's the same process. Okay, now your Atom.io might have some different colors. I'm choosing purposefully the dark colors and so if we go to Atom Preferences, you'll see um, under the settings of the preferences and ability to change the color scheme. I like using a dark color scheme. And so if we have a look here, um, go under here to themes, and then you can see here I've got Atom Dark, and the syntax theme is Atom Dark as well. If I was to put Atom Light, for instance, just select that, it will automatically update um, Atom Light. You can see, bang, voila, we've got, um, it's in the light mode now. Okay, and you can see, um, the syntax, if we set that to Atom Light as well, you'll see that now the syntax will change its color to see so it's now um, light on dark, okay? Um, actually, no, this might be better for us really. So let's leave it on light, Atom Light, okay? And that changes everything all at once. And so we can close this settings back down and there we go. So two files, uh, main program file, sandbox, save them as a .py file. Now, you also will need to know which folder you save those files into because that's where we've got to go to to then use Python to play or to read or to execute those programs that we've created, okay? How do we do that? Well, what we're going to do in this case is we're gonna open up, now this is a Mac, so we'll open up Terminal. If you're using a Windows machine, over, uh, use Command Prompt, okay? So go to your Start menu, hit Find, 
type into the find command prompt and then it will open up something that looks something a little bit like this okay now this is way too small so terminal preferences I think it's under preferences let's have a look I'm going to change the font size so uh, see the font here is Monaco 12 point I don't want that to be 12 point I want that to be more than 12 point. so let's make that do good do good do oh that's way too much let's make it uh, say 18 okay Terminate, terminate, terminate. Crimses. Let's go back here. Changed Monaco 18 point. Ah, okay. I know why. So, terminal, new window, pro. Okay, there we go. That made it bigger. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. I'll close this one here back down. Okay. So now you should be able to see that. I will put this just to the left there. All right, so this is our terminal. And what we need to do on terminal is we need to we need to now navigate so we're sitting in the file or the folder where we saved that file. So on a Mac, how do we do that? Well, you hit ls and it goes list and it says, okay, this is a list of the current contents of the folder. Now I know I need to change directory, so cd desktop, okay, and then cd programming, because I know that this is where I saved my stuff. cd.py prog. I think that's the spelling there. Now, if I've got too much stuff on the screen there, I can type clear and it will clear the, clear the screen. On a Windows machine, just type CLS and it will do the same thing. Um, now, I can't remember where I am, so let's have a think about what folder we're currently in. So if I hit LS, oh, we've got all this stuff here. You can see I've got advanced loops.py, Arduino serial.py, by spread. PY, circle moving to appear. So I've got a lot of Python files here, but it's not the one that I want because I know, for instance, that I've got another folder called line task. And in line task, I should have two files, and we can see that here line underscore sandbox and line underscore task. And remember, I've got line underscore task here and line underscore sandbox here. Brilliant. So now my command prompt or my terminal is now sitting in the same folder as what uh, I, I, same folder as where I've saved the files. So we've set up our basic workflow here. In our terminal, we can use type Python 3. Now this is a Mac, it comes with Python. I've installed Python 3. And so if I type in Python 3, it says, okay, Andrew, we're currently using Python 3.7.1, okay? Now we're actually in the in the Python uh, program. I don't want to do that. I'm going to exit. So I've exited out of the Python program. All I want to do is to run my files using Python. I don't want to have to go into Python or into idle and then run the programs. We're going to just say, hey, this program called line underscore task.py, we're going to use the Python 3. <coughs> if I just type Python on a Mac, you can see it says, oh, okay, Python 2.7.1. Um, Macs actually come shipping and I think Linux comes shipped with Python version 2. We're using Python version 3, okay? Count the fingers. There's three of them. We're using Python 3. So make sure you don't um, make sure you don't try and use Python 2. Now, the other thing that we're going to need before we get started is um, PsychoPy, okay? PsychoPy does a lot of the background rendering and the timing and the visual stimulation. Okay, so if we go to psychopy.org, all right, and what you'll do is you'll go to install up there, follow the steps, and install PsychoPy in, onto your machine. And so once you've done all that, now we're going to use PsychoPy again and again and again to read the documentation here, okay, and to look at the API, to, to look at what calls we can make. Okay, but anyway, let's go back to our terminal here. To make sure that you've got PsychoPy on board and you can access it, okay, go to Python 3. Remember, we're using Python 3. And just type from PsychoPy, PsychoPy, just to import, say, core. And if no errors come up, right, like that, no errors have come up, 
it's looked into the PsychoPy libraries and it's now imported the call functionality. And so now we're going to do that in our, in our experiments, okay? Because we're gonna use core.wait as one of our wait routines. So what I'm saying is, if you throw up a error with Python, you go into Python and you try and import from PsychoPy, import core. If that throws up a, an error like module not found, you haven't got um, either haven't got PsychoPy correctly installed or you haven't got it talking to uh, your Python friends. So you'll need to change the path variables. There's plenty of videos online on how to set up your path variables. Okay, let's get started. I'll clear that. Our workflow is ready to go. We've got our line task here. Open Atom, create a new file, save as. We're gonna delete that. We're gonna command S that, so that's saved. This is a sandbox area. Okay, great. We'll save that, we'll save that. We need some information. We're creating the line bisection task. Okay, here we are creating the line a line bisection task. Okay, super duper. Let's go back to the Kim paper and we will, we will need some information from that Kim paper. Remember, that's what we're basing it off. So here we go, Kim et al, 2005. Let's go down and see what they've done. Again, I'm looking here because this is the screen that I'm capturing. Okay, hemispatial neglect refers to the failure to attend to one side of one's own space. Okay, so there's a lot of <laughs> ones in there, but you know this is what we're talking about right at the start. Now, I need to get some information about the methods, just exactly what did they do to create their stimuli? What is, uh, let's just take a step back. What is the general uh, uh, task that we're doing here? Well, let's have a look at their paper. <clears throat> okay, here we can see figure one. Ignore these MRI scans down here. That's just showing where on the parietal cortex they've uh, stimulated with the RTMS. Concentrate up on this bit up here where we've got these words fixation, transsection, transsected or bisected line and mask, okay? So the task is this. We're going to create a blank screen and it's going to be white colored, white background. And in the middle, we're going to have a black cross. Now, if we think about it, that cross is actually a horizontal line and a vertical line. Okay, so we're going to need some rectangles or some lines from PsychoPy. Great. Now, that's going to be presented for a thousand milliseconds or one second. Okay, and we can see that here for one thousand milliseconds. It's being presented and then immediately after that we're going to see a stimulus which is a longer line and then halfway across that line you can see we've got a vertical riser or the transector so we've got a transected or a bisected line here and that only lasts 180 milliseconds and then immediately following that they're going to mask that stimulus and so they're going to blank it out somehow in this case what Kim have Kim et al. have done is they've basically made a thicker horizontal line and they've extended the vertical line all the way up to the top and the bottom of the screen. And that lasts for one second. And then what they're asking the subject to do is to hit uh, some keyboards or hit a button or a response box and say, okay, was the left half of this line longer? So as you can see here, we've got, let's say we've got this line here. Let me just zoom in a little bit more. So we'll go to the right here transected line. So what they're saying is, was the left side of the line longer or was the right side of the line longer? Okay, you have to pick one. You can't say that they were same, the, the same. It's either the left side was longer or the right side was longer. Okay. Or what they've asked the subject is, was the left side shorter or the right side shorter? So left side longer, right side longer or left side shorter, right side shorter. But remember, that stimulus was only on for 180 milliseconds, super quick, okay? And that's the task. And so they, they played a fixation, they then presented the stimulus, they then masked it, the subject had to respond, left longer, left shorter, right longer, right shorter, okay? And now the interesting thing, oh sorry, and then it repeats a certain number of times, okay? Over time, there might be 100 or 200 trials. Now. The interesting thing is this, in some of the trials, okay, this vertical part 
was bang, dead set in the middle of the line. Okay, And they call that a uh, bisected line. On some of them, that horizontal line was actually slightly to the left or slightly to the right. And that's a transected line. The subject doesn't know that some of the lines are perfectly split in the middle and that some of them are to the left or to the right. Okay. Regardless, they still have to make a choice. Was the left side longer? Was the right side longer? In healthy humans, so people with parietal cortex functioning okay and normal visual development, we tend to have a bit of a left bias. Okay, And we'll go through that in the future. We tend to say that the left side is different from the right side, even when we have a bisected line. We'll go through that in the future. So this is the task. We need to create a Python program that will present a fixation for a thousand milliseconds, a fixation cross, and then immediately transfer into a transected or bisected line. Remember, bisected line, that vertical part is directly in the middle. Transected line, that vertical part appears to be to the left or to the right of our stimulus. In all of our trials, we keep the vertical part the same. We will shift the horizontal one. Okay. Immediately following that, we then have to create another stimuli that will then mask um, what the subject saw. In our case, we're not going to use a fat horizontal and an and a extended vertical line. We're going to create a nice, sexy, bubble, circle, masking stimulus. We'll really try and create a complex stimulus from very simple starting points. Before we do this, however... <clears throat> We need to get some ideas of the colors of the backgrounds, the lengths of the lines. Uh, we've got durations here, uh, colors, and what we need to do for maskers and how many trials the subject did. We need to extract out of the methods, okay, durations, times, colors, and all that sort of stuff. So here we go. Let's just make this a little bit smaller. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shift this over to the right. So this is how I would probably approach creating an experiment for reals, as the kids would say these days. Now, so we're creating the line by section task. So you see here, I've got the line task open on the left. I'm going to write into the doc string here. Okay. And on the right here, we've got the paper. So I can pretty much just go from the right onto the left to take the information that we need. Now, uh, this is based off... Uh, based off uh, Kim et al. It's a 2005 neuroscience letters paper. Now, it's good. Ha it's a good habit to to write a doc string at the start of your Python programs and to comment all of your code. So then later on, when you come back to it, you know what you were doing or what you were trying to achieve when you wrote it. And it's also um, just polite and prof a professional thing to do. So, <clears throat> what stimuli do we need? Well, we've got three phases, don't we? We've got a fixation. And what was the fixation? So we read here, so this is just the method section. 20 healthy right-handed subjects. They don't like us left-handers. Uh, five males, 15 females. Okay, that's cool. Uh, it was approved by research, um, animal research, research board. Okay, here we go. The line by section task was designed as follows. All the stimuli were presented on the same monitor. That's fine. Driven by a Pentium 3 PC. <laughs> Holy dooly. Um, now, the stimulus consisted of a black horizontal transected or bisected line on a white background. So, fixation, stimulus, mask. So, the stimulus was, let's have a look here, black horizontal line. It was uh, transected or bisected. So what we're doing here is we're just getting an, an idea, just slowly, slowly, gently monkey sort of thing, okay? Just get the information out and think about it. We're not in a rush here. If you're in a rush, then obviously fast forward the videos and go to the end and you'll get all the, the whole code. Um, on a white background, okay, white background. Now, I know, for instance, that a white background, so I'm already thinking, in the red, the green, and the blue colors, remember, we've got three different color channels that we can use. If we set all three colors the same value, we'll get a gray. If we set them all maximum, we'll get white. And so I know that an RGB value for white is um, 111, okay, in PsychoPy. 
If we set that to zero, 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 here we go. If we set this RGB to zero, red, zero, green, zero, blue, okay, that's gonna be black, okay? Now, uh, stimulus, all right, great, uh, on a white background. Now, the horizontal line, so we're still in the stimulus. The horizontal lines were of five different lengths ranging from 36 to 40 degrees. Okay, so uh, five lengths, uh, 36, to 40 degrees and there's five of them so 36 37 38 39 40 okay so there's probably one degree difference between those so we'll go 36 37 38 39 and 40. now what units are they using here they're using a um degrees and so this is degrees visual angle so what does that mean that means that at a certain distance away from us okay a 36 degree visual angle let's say it's this long, okay, is gonna subtend 36 degrees at the retina of visual angle. So we're going to need to know how close our stimuli are being presented because if we're very close to the stimulus, okay, we don't need a very long line, okay, to subtend 36 degrees because it's so close. Whereas if I'm looking out here onto the hills of Hobart, I'm currently in Hobart, Tasmania, right, from over there to over there, okay, so from this side of the mountain to that side of the mountain, okay, it's quite wide, okay, but since it's so far away, so it's wide, it's probably five or six kilometers wide there, but it's still only subtending five degrees of visual angle. Okay, so we need to know how far away our stimuli, uh, our people were sitting. But anyway, so 36 degrees visual angle. Now, PsychoPi can use visual angles or degrees visual angle if you set up your computer monitor. What we're going to do is we're going to um, figure out how to convert everything into pixels. So 36 degrees visual angle, okay, equals 1056 pixels on the screen or whatever. And we'll go through that. So this is a bit, bit more advanced. Okay, so uh, we'll just put this here. Uh, so I'm just gonna cut and paste that just to remind us. VA stands for visual angle. So five lengths. So I'm going to need need to calculate uh, the number of pixels for this. Well, actually, I'm going to need to calculate how many centimeters is that, okay? So if the subject's sitting, say, 50 centimeters away, I know that 36 degrees visual angle is 15 centimeters. Okay, and so therefore, since that stimulus needs to be 15 centimeters, and I then know that my monitor here has a pixel density of say 35 pixels per centimeter, 15 times 35 is some number, and that's the number of pixels we're going to need. It will make sense in the future, relax, we'll get there. But eventually I'll need to calculate pixels. And then we convert that into pixels. Okay, so the stimulus is a black horizontal line. It's transected or bisected. The white background, five lengths. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, a short vertical line. Okay, so that's the horizontal line. And so now we've got a vertical line. So vertical line. Okay, a, okay so it's 2.2 degrees. So 2.2 degrees uh, visual angle. We'll have to do the same thing in terms of converting it into centimeters and then into pixels. Um, a short vertical line transected the horizontal lines. All the lines were 0 0.1 degrees thick. So thickness of lines is 0 0.1 degrees uh, 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 visual angle. Now I'm assuming that this, uh, this vertical line, um, this vertical line is also black. Okay, because it says up here, the stimulus consisted of a black horizontal. Okay, so this is also black. So RGB, uh, it's, uh, minus one, minus one, minus one. Ah, I said zero up there, didn't I? So that's a mistake from Andrew. If I set it all to zero, 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 what I get is a gray. Okay, because the colors are encoded from minus one to plus one. Okay, if you're interested, it's actually two to the power of eight, it's an eight bit value where zeros across the board is black and 255 across the board is white. But we won't go into that. If you're interested in that, you can look into that at your own leisure. 
Uh, when the line was asymmetrical about the transex transaction, okay, the on elongated line segment was one degree longer than the short. Oh, okay, so now it's saying when we shift the position of the line, okay, it's going to shift by one degree only. So off we'll call that offset. So say uh, vertical offset equals one degree, uh, one degree visual angle. And so whenever we present a stimulus that has to be shifted, so the line has to be shifted to the left or to the right, it's going to be shifted by one degree only, okay, for this experiment. Okay, um, the stimuli were always presented with the transaction mark in front of the subject's head and body midline. Okay, this is important. What this is saying, let's say um, my car key here is, no, that's not very big. Oh, okay, here, we'll use this uh this uh, Bluetooth speaker. Let's say this is a super fat vertical line, okay? And behind that we have our horizontal line. What it's saying is, is that this vertical line is always presented in the same spot on the screen. And the back line, so the horizontal line is the one that's going to shift. So we put the cross on, we then present the stimulus, okay? It's always the stimulus, vertical stimulus, the vertical line of the stimulus is always in the same spot. And we're going to present that at zero, zero. We're going to put it right bang into the middle of the screen. Uh, PsychoPi basically sets the middle of our canvas to be zero, zero. Okay. So transactive and the vertical always in midline. Now you might want to ask yourself, well, what's the, if we're testing for right hemispheric neglect, why don't we present it always in the left visual field? Okay. Or why, do we, or why don't we present in the right visual field? And that's a different experiment. And you have to ask yourself, well, what would you be answering in those situations? It's a very interesting thing to think about. Okay, so that's our stimulus. Um, so have, now, central fixation cross appeared for 1,000 milliseconds. Oh, how long was it? Okay, so central fixation cross. So again, this will probably be a black cross. Okay, how big was the black cross? Um, it doesn't say. Okay, so let's make the black cross say uh, one. Uh, so let's just make it uh, 0 0.1 degree visual angle. We'll see how it looks, okay? It's a black cross, one degree visual angle. So again, we'll need to calculate how many centimeters and how many pixels that will be. Um, its line width, its thickness will be uh, 0 0.1 degree visual angle like all the other ones and it lasts for 1000 milliseconds okay 1000 milliseconds duration so now i know using psychopi that we can use a core dot weight for 1000 okay or if we don't want to use that we want to use a inbuilt python library we can do time dot sleep oh <laughs> time dot sleep for one second okay so these are some things that we could use i'm just thinking of some ideas here Relax, we'll go through this in the future. Okay, or a time dot sleep, great. Um, stimulus was presented for 180 milliseconds. Appearance of the stimulus for 180 milliseconds. So stimulus, uh, whoops, let's put that back there. Let's put this, so this is 180 milliseconds. And so again, we could do a core dot wait for 180 or a time dot sleep for 0 0.18. Or we could do um, a flip, right? Uh, we could do uh, wind dot flip, uh, and we can go through that in the future if we know the frame rate of our uh, of our monitor. Okay. So stimulus, the mask. Okay, uh, this was immediately followed by the mask for one thousand milliseconds. Okay, so one uh, mm -mm -mm, milliseconds. So again, core dot weight. 1000 we have to make sure that that's in milliseconds actually time dot sleep i think this is in milliseconds okay sorry this is in seconds or uh, win zero uh, win dot flip for a certain number of frames okay what did they make for their mask now their mask was consisted of a thick horizontal line that was thicker than the horizontal line of the stimulus. <laughs> the mask was a thick horizontal line that was thicker than the horizontal... Oh, good heavens. <laughs> what a wonderfully wonderful sentence. Uh, yeah, okay, so remember, they made that thick horizontal line and they extended the vertical 
uh, line, so they mastered that. Uh, we're not going to do that. That's a bit meh. Nah. Let's make a nice, pretty uh, bubble. I'm going to call it a bubble mask. And this will comprise... 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 Uh, multiple... Random... Randomly placed... Overlapping... Circles... Of... Different radii and color. Now, we will, we will restrict our colors to grayscale. And so we'll have, say, minus one. So we'll have black. Um, we will have some grays. So remember, if they're all the same, but not minus one or one. And we'll have like another, say, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. 0 0.5, you know, so something like a mid-grey. Uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, something like that. And we will just cover the whole stimulus, okay? We'll cover the whole stimulus with this mask. Okay. All right, so that's our stimuli. So the subjects were comfortably seated 47 centimetres away. Ah, this is important, stimuli. All presented at 47 centimetres away from the screen. Brilliant. Now, the subjects had used their right index and middle fingers to make the responses using a mouse. Okay, so they used the mouse. We're going to use a keyboard, okay? And what we'll do right at the start is we'll say, okay, um, if they hit the letter F, now the reason I've chosen the letter F is because it's got a little bump on the keyboard here. If they chose the letter F, then their answer is, sorry, if they hit, yeah, the letter F, then that's the left side. So if the question is, is the left side longer, and they think it is, then they'll hit the letter F. If they think the right side is longer or shorter, depending on what, what we've got for that particular experiment, they'll hit the J button, okay? So again, the J is the one on this keyboard that has the little bump on it, okay? So let's go under the stimulus here and we'll go, okay, um, responses, uh, keyboard, and we are just setting this up before we even write the program. We're going to say uh, the letter F is for uh, left side. And we'll say the letter J. In fact, that's going to be the lowercase f. Okay. Because the lowercase f is different from the uppercase f when you're pulling in um, the code. What code uh, corresponds to that? The ASCII code is for right side. Okay. Now, think of this. They have to choose one or the other, left or right. They can't equiv uh, equivate. Uh, they can't not choose. Okay. So this is a two alternate force choice test. So there you go. That's a, a bit of information for you. So if they didn't know and they just guessed, because they have to choose one of two, their guess rate is going to be fifty percent. And so if you're if you're thinking, hey, what's the psychometric function that's underlying this? It's going to start at 50% and it's going to go all the way up to either 100% correct if we make it really easy. Or in fact, it's going to go to 100% minus their lapse rate. And, and that's all. Even when the stimulus is super easy, they still get one wrong or a couple wrong. And that's going to drop down from those very high percentages. I'm getting off track here. But anyway, it's a two alternate force choice task. Now, how are we going? Uh, recording for 38 minutes so far. All right, this is a... Uh, a good, solid opening um, video. We're not quite finished yet, but we are pretty dang close. So, responses, keyboard, F, J. Now, we're going to put in uh, an escape, okay? This is gonna be our own private information. We won't tell the subjects. If we hit the Q button, we will exit the uh, Python program. back to so back to command prompt or your terminal okay so this is for us this is stuff we're going to need to put in okay so the responses keyboard fj and q they don't know about q but we do now so in half of the task blocks the subject was asked to press the left or the right mouse button according to whether the left or the right side appeared longer so the task is as follows task is as follows so we've got the stimuli we've got the stimuli timing and the input but what's the actual experiment Okay, in half trials, the subjects are told which side is longer, left 
All right. Okay. In the other half of the trials, half of trials, they are then asked which side is shorter. So this is what they're told, okay? Left or right. Okay, so that's the subject. Uh, shorter side of the line. The subjects were then asked to respond as quickly as possible. Uh, please respond as as quickly as possible. Okay, but they were, they were, they were. Let's have a look here. They were instructed not to sacrifice accuracy for sake of speed. Okay, so priority is correct. Is correct. Not quick. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Now let's have a look. How many times do they do this? Here we go. An experimental session. So experimental session. So we've asked the person to come in and, and do our experiment for us. It comprises four blocks of a task, four blocks of task, and each block contained 40 trials, four blocks of 40 trials. Okay, and in that 40 trials, 10 were bisected. Remember, bisected is that line perfectly splits the horizontal line in two, so they're equal lengths. Okay, 10 were bisected, 15 were left elongated, Elon Musk gated, <laughs> okay, and 15 were right elongated. See, we told our subjects, okay, one of the sides is going to be longer, one of the sides is going to be shorter, or we told them to respond which of the side is longer or shorter, but they don't know that 10 out of 40, so a, a, a quarter of the trials, they were bisected. These are the, these are the lines that we're interested in. Not the left or the right sided ones, but rather the bisected. Okay. The subjects were informed that each side of the line was elongated in 50% of the trials. Yeah, that's what I just said. <laughs> that's what I just said. But they were unaware that in a quarter of the trials they were um, that they, they were purely bisected. Okay. Uh, stimuli were presented in random order. Okay, so random order. So of the 40 trials, we want to randomly present the 10 bisected, the 15 left longer, and the 15 right longer. Is it okay if I put LL and RL there? That RL just means right longer, okay? LL stands for left longer. Okay, so it's good that they're random. Okay, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. now the stimuli are presented in a random order within each block and the four blocks were counterbalanced. What does that mean? Now, remember, two of these trials, <coughs> Okay, so two, two of the four blocks, they were told to pick out the shorter, which, which line is shorter. In the other two blocks, they were told, hey, uh, which line is longer. Okay, so what they're saying is, is that they've counterbalanced. So you got uh, your subject, uh, Persephone, she's come in and done your experiment. And what you've done is you said, okay, she's going to start with a shorter question. Okay, Persephone, please, this is the first time you've done it, um, the first block. Um, which side is shorter, all right? And then the next block, she'll do longer. So shorter, longer, shorter, longer, okay? And then if she comes back again, say two days later, she's had a treatment or something like that, you then say, oh, okay, we're going to counterbalance. So now, Persephone, which side was longer? And then you go longer, shorter, longer, shorter. So this is a process of counterbalancing. So there is the less likely for any biases or any sort of nested interactions um, to build up and then skew the results, okay? Another way that you could think of this is, let's say you've got, say, um, 50 subjects coming in the door, so the <laughs> stupid undergraduates are trying to get credit points for their Psych 100 unit, okay? What you want to do in 50% of your subjects, okay, they will start with the short, and then they'll go short, long, short, long. The other 50 of 50% of your subjects, they'll go long, short, long, short. And so therefore, you've counterbalanced the stimulus presentation or the block order. That's what they're saying here. Okay, the subjects performed a session having a total of 160 trials. So 40 trials, counterbalance. So 160 trials, tyrals, trials, okay. Uh, over a period of seven minutes per session. And it took about, how long? Seven minutes. 
Okay, so we're expecting this to take about seven minutes. And then what happens? Uh, then they had a thousand trains of 10 hertz RTMS applied for... Okay, so this is going into their TMS paradigm and we're not going to be looking at transcranial magnetic stimulation. We're just creating the program. Right, wow, we've just done a fair bit of super quick um, pulling out of information and creating a, a, a basically a template document here based on the experiment that we're trying to replicate. Wow, this is super exciting. We've done very little Python programming, but we've done a lot of planning. We've just got one little bit of planning left to do. Remember up here, we had all of these degrees of visual angle. Okay, you can see that there. How the heck do we go from degrees of visual angle to centimeters, to then pixels? I gave you a very broad uh, approach. We calculate the centimeters and then we calculate the number of pixels based on the pixel density. But how do we do it? So let's have a look. We'll delete this here. We're gonna to go to a website called Elvers, e -l -v -e -r -s .us forward slash perception forward slash visual angle. Okay, it's up here. And what this will do is calculate for us the centimeters according, uh, the centimeters that a stimulus is uh, according to the visual angle and according to the distance from the retina. So if you go to this website down here, you'll see down the bottom the calculator. And what we need to do is enter two of the three items. And so we need the object size, the object distance, and the visual angle. Oh, this is great. We've got two of these. We know, for instance, that the subject is seated seated 47 centimeters away. Now, this is, I believe, an American website. And so we will see if they can run with metric centimeters. So the object distance is 47. So, oh, here we go. Size and distance must be entered in the same unit. So it's a relevant of unit. So if you're in America, you want to run with inches, you run with inches. Okay. We're going to use centimeters here. Visual angle must be entered in degrees. Well, that's okay. We've got that there. So let's have a look. Let's start here with the five lengths of the horizontal line. 36 degrees visual angle at 47 centimeters. So visual angle, 36 degrees. We can see the little degree button here at 47 centimeters. We need an object size of 30.5425 centimeters. So 30.5425 centimeters. And now we just need to convert that into pixels and we'll do that in a little bit. So we'll do this for all of these for 36. So we'll clear this out, we'll delete that out. We'll then go to 37. This should be slightly longer, 31.45. Now, if you're interested in the maths that, underlying, that underlines this, um, go to show calculations here and it will show you the calculations. I'm going to pause this recording and I'm going to fill out all of this bit of information because you don't need to see that and then we'll return back to it um, in a little bit. Okay, so I'll just pause it now. Okay, so we're returning back now. I've filled out all of these bits of information. So we know now that a 0 0.1 degree visual angle at 47 centimeters will give us a centimeter, a 0 0.082 centimeters. And so we've gone and filled out all of that information. So one degree visual angle at 47 centimeters, we need a line that is 0 0.82 centimeters long. So just under a centimeter long. Okay, and I filled out the 2.2 .2 degrees. So the vertical line is 1.8 centimeters high. The thickness of lines is 0 0.82 and um, our horizontal lines are between 30 and a half centimeters to 34.2 centimeters long. So that's how long um, the line is. And I think PsychoPi can also deal with centimeters if you put that in as the units. What we're going to do is we're going to convert this again into pixels. And so what we need to do now is I'm presenting my stimulus on this external monitor. Now it's a Dell monitor. And so what I'm going to need to do is to calculate the pixel density in the horizontal. Now we assume that the pixel density, so that's the number of pixels per centimeter in the horizontal, okay, in the horizontal 
in the x axis is going to be the same as the pixel density in the vertical axis okay so let's have a look i'm going to pause the video again try and find the specifications of this monitor and i'll we'll try and find the pieces of information that we need okay so i'll just pause again and then we'll return in a little bit okay so the monitor that i'm going to be presenting this inf uh, the stimuli on is a dell se 2419 hr and so i've just typed that into google and i've looked for the specifications the information that we're chasing here are the the screen width in centimeters and the number of pixels across that um, that screen width and so we've got general information here we've got display information here and so here we've got the screen width of this um, of this monitor is 52.7 centimeters so let's put this down here um, monitor specifications now you will need to find this information out for yourself so the screen width equals uh, 52.7 centimeters okay and the screen height equals 29.6 centimeters and the number of pixels wide how many pixels are, are present on this screen in the x axis let's have a look down here so the screen resolution that's what we're looking for 1920 so that's 1920 by 1080 oh 1080 so that means that this pixel density so this is number of pixels per centimeter equals will it be 1920 pixels if we go wide divided by the screen width which would be 52.7 so the pixel density in the x-axis Okay, that's how we would calculate that. Now, the pixel density in the x-axis should be exactly the same or very close to the pixel density in the y-axis. And so we only should need to calculate this once, but we can calculate this twice. Well, in fact, let's just, before we end this video, let's just calculate this using a Python program. Okay, so let's come under our doc string here. And what we're going to do here is we'll say, okay, uh, print okay we'll save that so now you can see that blue circle up the top there is gone and what we're going to do is we're going to go to terminal here we'll type in python3 line task.py and if everything's good we'll see hey it's printed out okay on the top there so we're talking to the correct program what i like to do at the start of the of of my video uh, my python files is i like to clear the garbage or the previous um, information that was presented on the terminal so the way that we can do that with a single line of code that will do both windows uh, that will do windows mac and linux programs is we need some help from one of the python libraries so we're going to import os okay and then what we're going to do is we're going to say os.system this means that from the os library we want to access the system uh, functions or routines and what we're going to do is we're going to pass cls so we're going to pass the string cls if os.name so if the name of the operating system os equals put the two equals there nt so nt is shorthand for windows machine so if the name of the operating system is windows it's going to pass to the system cls excuse me i've got the dishwasher running in the background there i don't know if you can hear that now, if it's not NT, so if we're not running through Windows machines, we'll say else, we're going to hit, we're going to pass clear. And so with this one line of code, we're going to essentially clear the output of our command prompt. So if we run this program again, okay, OS has no attribute system. Okay, why is that? That's because I spelt it wrong. S-Y-S-T-M. Now that's going to be a feature of our programming together. I can't, my, I've got gravy filled fingers here and I'm very clumsy and I'm not using the best keyboard, but I'm not going to blame the tools. It's all me, but hey, it's a learning experience. So control 
Command S that to save that. But this is good. We've got some stuff here that we want to clear. So if we run this program again, for me to write that very quickly, all I hit was the up button. Okay, we run that again. Hey, it's done that. It's cleared everything out. So if I just write stuff and it says, hey, bash, stuff not found, what I can do is I can just hit up twice and you see it's cleared everything out. Great. This is really good. Excellent work. So what do we want to do? We wanted to calculate the pixel density. So what we'll do is we'll create, say, screen pix x equals, okay, so this is a variable, and it's going to equal the number of pixels, okay, which we know was 1920, divided by the screen width, and we know that's going to be 52.7, okay, and then what we'll do is we'll print out the screen uh, the pixel density is okay and what we'll do is we'll leave it as a floating point number so we'll do percentage and we'll go three uh, three in front of the decimal point say four values after the decimal point okay and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll go scn pix x okay We'll do the same for the screen pix y. So I'm just selecting that, command C, okay, command V. We'll put y there, we'll put y here. And so the y, number of pixels in the y is 1080. And the screen height is 29.6. Okay, command S that. We then run over to our, our command prompt, python3 line task.py. And as we can see here, it's printed out. The pixel density is 36.43. To six, okay. So what we'll do here is we'll just put a uh, x-axis here, just to remind ourselves, and we'll put y-axis here, y-axis here. But as you can note there, I'll just command S again. As you can see there, they're pretty much bang on. So it's thirty-six point four three. So here we've got our pixel densities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we know if we have a stimulus, right? That's Oh, look, we, we've actually got something here. So if we've got a stimulus that's 30 centimetres long, or 30.54 centimetres long, we know that at 36 pixels per centimetre, our stimulus is going to need this many pixels to operate or to run. And so you need to get this information for your own monitor. Okay, and... Um, I know that PsychoPi in the monitor center does this automatically for you. If you set up your monitor, what I'm doing here is I'm actually taking you through the very fundamental approach to get this information for yourself so you're aware of how to do it and what it means and why it's important to do this. When we're designing our experiments, if we put garbage in, we're going to get garbage out. And so I'm just trying to get you to think about and to critically analyze every part of your program because then we can trust the output. Remember, our subjects are idiots. You ask your best friend to come and do your experiment for you. We can't trust them, but if we can trust our program and that our program's written well and correct, then the error always lies with the subject and not with the program. We'll leave this video here it's about 58 minutes long, so it's been a long slog, but I'm purposefully going slow to try and make it easy and gentle for you so that in the future you can come back to this and go, oh, that's what we're doing, or oh, hang on, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I'm trying to keep it simple. What we'll do right there at the end of this video series is we'll just go and really burn through and sort of give you a very condensed overview. This is what I hope we can do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all these calculations for the number of pixels that we're going to need, okay? Fill in these lines of my doc string and this line of my doc string. And in the very next super wonderful, super bumper program video, we will then start making our experiments, okay? All the best. I hope to see you in the next video. If not, all the best. And... Um, it's going to start getting really cool really soon. All right, catch you later.